Hi, and welcome to the long-awaited second lore video on the game Necropolis. If you have not seen the first video, I would strongly recommend it, as not only do I cover the lore on some of the more significant factions within the game, but also explain somewhat what it is I hope to achieve with these kind of videos. But in the interest of keeping introductions down to a minimum, let us continue our delve into the deep lore of this dark and dangerous dungeon. Within its sprawling hallways and harsh terrain exist several beasts and threats of nature. Spiders, the burrowing delvers, dogs, rats, eldritch parasitic fungi that even contest the grind and horde men for dominion over the marshlands and swamps of the necropolis, as well as its own variant of reptiles. A common trait exists between all the fauna of the necropolis. Hardiness. Resistance to change and the latent ability to adapt. All of these beasts are adept at making the best of any given situation in the interest of survival. Be it living off and depending on another organism, or avoiding those who would threaten them. Be it scrounging or hunting, trapping or foraging, these creatures are some of the best at what they do. Having already fully covered the topic of spiders in great depth and detail in my previous video, I shall now move on to talking about the Delvers. Oh god, uh, I'm not quite sure how that got in there. Delvers are massive, earth-dwelling, thorny beasts, which primarily attack by hurling their entire body mass at the player. They possess huge clawed paws and a reinforced stone maw that allows for devastating attacks as well as providing them with the ability to swiftly burrow underground, and due to this nature it is no wonder you never encounter them on the surface floors. I have reason to believe that these creatures are native to whatever the necropolis used to be, given that they are both adult and juvenile variants of the monsters, the latter known as diggers. They appear to not have been born from, but rather tainted by the poisonous mineral, corrupting the necropolis known as the Grine which likely found its way into their system due to the fact that they tunnel primarily by feeding the earth and soil through their mouth and out the other side. Which is why you see grind crystals growing all down their backs and coating their claws. The grind is a taint on this world and corrupts even the very soil you walk on. Dogs are the odd one out in regards to the necropolis's very brief list of wildlife, namely because they are not wild. They were brought here by those they serve, initially domesticated well-trained hunting dogs, but now, due to the passage of time and the corrupting aura of this environment, they have turned feral, yet still somehow remain at the sides of their mindless masters, who in turn are now in servitude to the latent forces of the necropolis. They are also called Inugami for some reason, which is moonspeak for dog god and I don't really have much to say about it. The rats of the necropolis have survived due to their small size and ability to hide. But just because their strongest attribute is evasion does not mean they are in any way exempt from the alterations the necropolis inflicts on everything residing within it. The rats are mutated by some means, three-headed, three-tailed. Whether through the mad, disfiguring energy of the necropolis, the radiation emitted from the power plants you find on the lower levels, or by some freak experiment or a combination of the three. They are still disgusting and a stain on the otherwise beautiful and ornate Egyptian architecture the necropolis has to offer. Rats, however, are not the sole source of all the pestilence and disease in this place, disgusting though they might be. Entire floors are sometimes overrun by a parasitic fungal life form known as the molders. They excrete a plume of spores that if a life form is too weak to reject, will consume them. And in a place where the mind and body are fractured by the very carcinogenic air they breathe, a weakened host isn't hard to come by. This pestilence has spread so widely that it even challenges the grind and droves of hordemen for dominion in some places, most particularly the wetlands of the necropolis. The molders and infected hosts are hostile to all factions and enemies except for those they live besides, namely the Shell Mages. The Shell Mages are a puzzling group indeed. It is thought that they could perhaps be the source of many of the scrolls' incantations and potions which exist within the necropolis. Reason being, they are the only beings within its flaws that have the ability to wield such potent magic. 
What we ourselves are capable of is only an attempt to discern the effects of what appears to us to be barely readable scrolls. Even when picking up a shell mage's staff, our only use for it is as a blunt instrument. To us, their well-crafted catalysts are nothing but glorified clubs or maces, and could never hope to harness their true potential. It is also thought- uh, that's the wrong clip. There we go. It is also thought that they first arrived in the necropolis as wandering pilgrims, searching for a place to live in solitude from the outside world to practice and perfect their magic arts. Their relationship with the Moulders surely is a baffling one. There are even rare variants of the Shell Mage that can summon infected ones to their aid using incantation. Perhaps they were the ones to create the Moulders in the first place. Perhaps through being snails, having an unclean living has boosted their immune systems to a degree that they are unaffected by the Moulders' fungal spores. And so the two, instead of fighting, coexist and aid one another to mutual benefit. It may be that they are able to protect themselves from invasive spores with a magical barrier, or perhaps their vast intellect and knowledge for poultices, droughts, and potions has allowed them to create a cure for the fungal infection so that their commensalistic relationship does not turn parasitic. All we know, however, is that their partnership in battle allows for the powerful shell mages to weaken foes further, allowing for molders to feed and further extend their grip on the lands they inhabit. And finally, possibly the most bizarre and hard to understand creature of the necropolis, the reptiles, commonly known as changelings. As such because they have the ability to shapeshift, changelings were most likely a close relative to some form of reptiles like the chameleon, and over time their ability to change colour as a defence mechanism has been significantly altered by the necropolis's latent disfiguring energy. As a mechanism for defence, camouflage is useful, but shapeshifting brings a whole new realm of possibilities for the changeling. Now not only can they use it to hide from potential competition or unnecessary combat, they can use it to bait prey. An unaware, naive adventurer would see a fade, an imp-like creature prized for the arcane dust that they drop, and charge in to attack, expecting it to die quick and easy, but then only to be taken off guard when it quickly transforms into a towering, aggressive and nimble monster. No, not like that, okay. Mimics are the same sort of premise, and they employ the same kind of strategy, but I promise, changelings are different, and far less annoying. Hey, so I wanted to say thank you for sticking around to watch the video to the end, and for those of you who made it here, I have a few things to say. You see, as much as I may like doing videos on Necropolis, it's not really an especially relevant game anymore, which is unfortunate, but... I want to gear my channel towards this more creative style of content, and would like to ask your opinion on the sorts of things I could perhaps do in the future, so just let me know, I'm open to ideas. Anyway, thanks again, and I guess I'll see you next time, I fucking hate outros, bye.